Hello everyone and welcome to the National Museum of Australia here in Canberra. My name is Lily Withicombe and I'm lucky enough to be a curator here at the National Museum. And I'm here today with my colleagues Shona Coyne and Ian Coates. And we're delighted to see you here today with us for another episode of Live at the Museum. Now we begin as always with an acknowledgement of country. And I acknowledge that we are standing here on the lands of the Ngunnawal, the Noonawal and the Ngambri peoples. And I pay my deepest respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here at the museum today or who might be watching this live stream. Now in today's program, we're gonna be diving into some of the behind the scenes stories of the making of our latest exhibition, which is Endeavour Voyage, the untold stories of Cook and the first Australians. Now I was a curator on this exhibition and I can tell you that working on this show has been a truly amazing experience. It's taken us to all kinds of places. Some of us went to the United Kingdom, New Zealand, all the way up and down the east coast of Australia to remote communities, to art and culture centres, to ship workshops and to some school art programs as well. Now there have been a lot of uh, surprising and unexpected parts of the making of this exhibition and here with me today are two of my colleagues who are going to be talking with us about this. So I will be introducing my colleagues, Shona Coyne, who is a Manang woman from Western Australia, from Albany in Western Australia. And in fact, she moved here from Western Australia to Canberra just to work on this exhibition. She was one of the lead curators on the exhibition. Uh, and she's gonna be talking with us about some of her background experience working on this exhibition, especially Indigenous consultation. And also with me here is Dr. Ian Coates, who is the project lead of this exhibition. Before this, he's worked on several exhibitions at the exhibition, in fact, many of them, and many collections as well. Uh, extensive experience in curatorial and research here at the museum. Now, of course, the three of us are part of a much larger team of people who worked on this exhibition. It's certainly not just the three of us, and some other people I'd like to mention in particular, and who aren't here today with us, are Alana Garwood-Hong, Senior Indigenous Curator, uh, Kayla Borman, Assistant Curator, and Janie Wood, who is the creative producer for the exhibition. Now, for visitors who are nearby and in Canberra, I'm sure that you can see all the people around me, please be assured that we are open. You are very welcome to visit the museum and the Canberra site, and please be assured that your safety is our first priority. So do come and visit the exhibition. Now, for those who aren't able to visit the museum at the moment, we've made a short video which is gonna introduce you to this exhibition. So we'll play. This show is so significant because it's the first time that Australians have had an opportunity to hear, I guess, the two sides of this story. In a way, the view from the ship, coming out of Cook's journal and Banks's journal, and the view from the shore, from the descendants of those people who were on the coast in 1770. We knew that visitors probably had a sense that they already knew the story, so we had to find a way that we could introduce something new into the story and, and present it in a way that they might not have expected, but also in a way that they can still understand. And so the device we came up with was to literally create the East Coast of Australia. When you enter the exhibition, the first thing that will strike you are these recreation of three water spouts, which the voyagers on the Endeavour experienced soon after they saw land at Point Hicks. For people at Point Hicks, they were a warning of what things to come. Then as you progress through the, the space, you literally follow the coastline of Eastern Australia. And dotted along like that coastline are stories from nine communities we've worked with, all the way from Point Hicks, through Kamei Botany Bay, through 1770, through Warrumbah and uh, Endeavour River, and finally up to Possession Island at the tip of Cape York. In this 
the 250th year uh, of Cook's voyage up the coast of Australia. It was an extraordinary moment in the history of this landscape. We thought, what a great opportunity to tell one of the big stories in Australia's history. But clearly, it's a story where we need to work with Indigenous communities about getting their perspectives on that story. And this is really the first time that Australians have had the opportunity to hear um, many of those stories. And in each of the nine locations we worked, there's a slightly different story um, about what happened in 1770, but also the kind of later history that people connect back to that moment in our past. The Woodja Woodja Driftwood uh, pieces we've got in the show, I think are one of the real highlights. My curatorial colleague, Shona Coyne, had the opportunity to work with the artists at Woodja Woodja. What's on display here is a beautiful collection of artworks that artists from the Woodjil Woodjil community created. The Woodjil Woodjil community are connected to the Endeavour story because as we know the Endeavour voyage sailed up the east coast of Australia in 1770 and part of that journey the ship collided with the Great Barrier Reef in one point and this reef is actually probably about 10 kilometres off the shore of Weary Bay which is right off opposite Woodjil Woodjil. As you can see here, there's a whole range of topics. Uh, everything from shield designs that we have over here, we've got scenes from where the ship were throwing over barrels of grog, and also this beautiful piece over here, which is actually one of my favourite pieces, where it's a coral branch that would have broken off from the reef at the time. We are just so delighted that we got a chance to work with the Banner Yiriji Art Centre and the artists that are there through the workshop, we've managed to acquire 48 of their artworks and it's such a significant body of work. Because not only does it reflect their perspectives on the Endeavour Voyage, but it's also a great record of the amazing cultural and botanical knowledge that this community holds. All of the objects in the show have great stories. One in particular for me holds both the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous side of that story. The shield made by an unknown Indigenous maker at Kame Botany Bay in the 1930s is a terrific object. It features the landing of Cook, it also features the opening of the Harbour Bridge in the 1930s, and it also features some of the plants and animals that are distinctive to the Botany Bay region. And in representing all three of those sides of the story, it gives us something very special. There are so many objects in the exhibition that take us back to those moments in 1770 and link us to the people who are on that ship. My colleague Michelle Hetherington has picked out a few to tell you about. I'm standing next to one of six quarter pounder cannon that were thrown overboard from HMB Endeavour on the evening of June the 11th. 1770. The six cannon were those that were on deck when the ship ground on the Great Barrier Reef. It was a terrible, terrible moment for the people on board the ship, but the cannon are like little time capsules. They went overboard, they were covered by over a metre of coral by the time they were rediscovered one year short of 200 years from the event. This is Captain Cook's handwritten journal of his voyage in the Endeavour from 1768 to 1771. This is again another one of those objects that connect you to Australian history so beautifully. Over 250 years old, when it was first started to be written in, it bears the impress of the hand of the person who wrote it, who's long dead, but who lives still in the words that remain on the page. In 2020, it being the 250th anniversary of that moment in 1770, Australians are more open to reconsidering how we understand what, what went on in 1770 and its implications today. So I think the exhibition we've done here, there's an opportunity for it to 
influence Australians' understanding of their past going forward. So in that sense, I think it is a really significant show and perhaps one of the most important ones we've done in our short history. I feel really humble about the stories that communities have shared with us, individuals in communities have shared with us. But I also feel proud that I think we've done justice to those stories and that we've told their stories in keeping with the way they would have wanted them told. And I feel really good that the culmination of all those stories really affects our visitors. And it can change the way people think about what Australia is and what it can be. I hope you all enjoyed that introduction to the exhibition. Now, the most important part of any exhibition is the beginning and the end. So Ian, can you tell me about the beginning of the exhibition? And then Shona, I'm going to ask you to tell me about the ending of the exhibition. So one of the, the challenges of the exhibition was that we wanted to tell the story of what happened in 1770 in a very different way. And so what that required was to I really signal that at the beginning of the exhibition and provide a beginning that was kind of unexpected. So we weren't going to just open up with, well, Cook you know, saw land at Point Hicks on the south coast of um, Australia and then it went on from there. So what we did was we pulled out something that happened on the same day that the voyagers saw this land, which was they saw these three enormous water spouts just off the shore. And they really fascinated um, Joseph Banks. And what was amazing about them as well was when we worked with the Aboriginal community down in Point Hicks, they immediately said, those water spouts, they were omens. They were a warning from the ancestral spirits. And we realised that what that meant was that these water spouts had kind of two aspects of the story we were trying to tell. They had a really, um, the story of uh, Banks' interest in science and the, the phenomena that he was seeing in this new landscape, but they also had a really deep and powerful Indigenous meaning. And I guess that's, that's the kind of two parts of the story that the whole exhibition uh, is about. But also, they enabled us to create a kind of a multi-sensory experience and people would walk in, experience that and think, I don't know what's going on. This is really different to what I expected. I need to, I need to re-look at what this show is about and kind of understand this story from a fresh perspective. So that's what, what we were trying to do with that opening. And just as importantly, of course, is the end experience. And what we we're really trying to create is a space where audiences can contribute to this really important discussion around the importance of the events in 1770 and how we should remember this anniversary into the future. So what we've created is a, a wall display with a landscape where audiences can write a little note or a message, answer a question and leave it behind for other people to have a look and explore. And they've been absolutely fascinating. Like some of the uh, pictures, they're small drawings, messages about Indigenous land rights, about the incredible seamanship of Cook and the crew. There's a whole raft of um, ideas that are happening from Australian audiences. And what will be really interesting is when the exhibition closes, we'll collate all of these together and we'll talk about how the, I guess the conversation changes over time and that will be a fascinating project to work on as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks both of you. Now I have a question for you Ian. So what were some of the discoveries that you made in the process of putting together this exhibition? There were many discoveries along the way Lily and, and that's kind of what you want in, a, in a, an exhibition, in making an exhibition because if you, you knew exactly how it was going to end up when you started it, it wouldn't be as exciting and interesting to work on. I guess two things kind of stand out for me uh, when I think about, you know, discoveries. Uh, one is kind of realising the kind of generosity and wisdom of many people in those uh, Indigenous communities that we worked with, their preparedness to share their insights into this um, story that is kind of at the heart of our nation for all sorts of reasons. But I guess um, another one more about, you know, individual objects was I, the, the moment when I found myself in the reading room of the Royal Geographical Society in London and the librarian brought out 
Joseph Banks' travelling stove, which he had on the ship with him. Uh, and, you know, there was no explanation of exactly what the different parts of it was. It was a bit like a Trangia travelling camping stove. And there were, you know, lamps, there was a nutmeg grater, there were like little bottles. And, you know, we probably don't know, we won't know what all of those were for. But it was a moment where in handling them and trying to work out how all those things worked, it really brought home that the, the events of 1770 are kind of real and they're tangible and they're kind of reaching out to you as you're handling that material. Uh, and that was kind of like a bit of a, a bit of a moment in the, in the sort of development of the exhibition for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And look, now I have a question for Shona. So I know that there was a lot of community engagement up and down the east coast of Australia with Indigenous communities. And I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about this engagement, but also especially about the workshops that you developed. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, this project has been going for about two and a half years now. So we've been really lucky to work with around nine different Indigenous communities all along the east coast of Australia. And part of the programming that we wanted to do was to provide an opportunity or platform for Indigenous communities to contribute to this conversation through art. So we partnered with the Indigenous Art Centre Alliance and we held a number of workshops with three of the uh, community groups that we were working with in far north Queensland. Uh, one of those workshops was with the Banner Yiriji Art Centre, the Wudja Wudja mob up there. And through that workshop, we went through the ship's journals and they picked out some of the stories that were really important to them and painted them onto these pieces of driftwood that might have been fragments of the ship washed up onto the beach. And they're in the exhibition today, so they're absolutely beautiful displayed all together. Yeah, they're beautiful. I love those pieces. Okay, now we have a question that's come in from the audience from Norma. And it's, is it true that there were lots of animals on the ship? So I might jump in and answer this one. Yes, Norma, there were lots of animals on the ship. Joseph Banks brought two greyhounds with him. They were used to hunt animals while on shore. There were also goats, sheep. When the ship went to New Zealand, they picked up a litter of uh, pigs. There was a cat. And it's worth noting that everyone on the ship was male, except for the goat who was female. And I always feel quite sorry for that poor old girl. Okay, so look, we have another question that's coming in from the audience. This one is from Adrienne. So what was the most surprising fact you learned about on the Endeavour voyage? Shona, I might throw this one to you. Um, do you know, I guess it was actually around the size of the ship. I never realised how small it was. And in total, including the animals that Lily was talking about earlier, 94 men on a really small coal carrying ship. Um, that was really surprising to me to see how actually their conditions were. And another thing is, you can see why the stove that Ian was talking about earlier, everything needed to be really compact and small considering the spaces that they were living in. It must have been pretty tight and I imagine pretty smelly. What about you, Ian? Is there any surprising facts that really jumped out at you? No, <laughs> not none that jump out at me at the moment. Yeah, fair enough. Look, we have another question here from Bronia. Uh, okay, this is a good one. What is your favourite object? And look, I actually might jump in first. So I'm not going to say one single favourite object. I'm going to say that I think that my favourite objects are the artworks that were created by school children up and down the east coast of Australia. So we engage with school children in Canberra, in Sydney, in La Perouse, um, in, and in Cooktown in the far north Queensland. And we engage in these two-day workshops. The first day was an introduction to printing, the second day was an introduction to watercolour painting. It was all led by Naomi Zawa. And we also invited local Indigenous leaders and elders and storytellers to come and talk about the history of 1770, but from their perspective. And then we led school children through these workshops and they created the most amazing works which really reflect the perspective of children uh, on this history and it's really important that we included children's voices in the exhibition. So many children in primary schools across Australia are in fact studying this history and perhaps they're the people who are thinking about this the most deeply and the works range from these beautiful portraits of Cook to incredible landscape images as well. 
uh, they're really quite moving and so I encourage you to come and see the exhibition you'll see these three distinct sections with black and white prints and these really vivid watercolours. They really are a beautiful insight into what children are thinking and feeling about this history. Now I'm going to throw the question to Shona, what's your favourite object? Well, a little bit like yours Lily, I actually really love the Hope Vale uh, light boxes. So these were another um, arts workshop that we ran with the Hope Vale community. So that's about um, 45 minutes northeast, uh, northwest, sorry, of Cooktown. And we went there with an arts facilitator and spent time just really looking through the ship's journals and reading some of the passages together. And the ladies that were the artists there, the Gumba Gumba ladies, created these light boxes. Now, if you don't know what a light box is, it's a wooden frame and it's got sort of four sides to it and they painted onto the surface of these plywoods and they picked out particular parts in the journals that related to the 48 days that Cook was in Wallambalbiri or which is now Endeavour River in Cooktown as we know it today. So once they've painted all of these artworks onto the plywood, they actually drilled holes through it, highlighting the different areas that they wanted to bring to life. And what we've done is we've backlit them, mounted them on the wall, and now when you see them in the exhibition space, they just sparkle. They're absolutely gorgeous, and we're really, really delighted to have them in here. Yeah, they are really beautiful objects. Okay, Ian, what about you? What's your favourite object? Yeah, look, there's so many in there, it's hard to just pick one. So I'm actually going to pick two. So uh, the first one is an amazing work by Michael Cook, who is a contemporary Indigenous artist up in Brisbane. And he went to London and created these extraordinary photo-based artworks that were imagining London being invaded by uh, Australian Indigenous people and animals. Uh, and he's kind of like playing around with that idea about just reversing the story and it goes very much to the biggest story that we're trying to tell in this show which is you know there are different views from the shore and views from the ship but he's kind of created this sense of drama in this enormous work you know as these everyday Londoners kind of confront these giant iguanas uh, and you know school books are being thrown around and people are just looking amazingly kind of worried about what's happening on. You have to come and see it, it's a great, a great work, it's, you get it immediately. The other one that um, I really touches me are the spears that uh, an elder from La Perouse, Rod Mason, has made in response to the three spears we have in the show uh, that were acquired from Botany Bay in 1770. And we've got three historic ones, and then we've got about 40 um, new ones that Rod's made. And they are such a statement about how Rod and the community at La Perouse uh, retain that knowledge of how to make those spears, and kind of like they are the custodians of that story at La Perouse. And to me, that's a really powerful part of the show. Yeah, they're amazing. Okay, we have a question that's come in from Alice. Thank you, Alice, for your question. You're asking, what have been the reactions of visitors to the differing perspectives in this exhibition? Excellent question. I think I'm gonna throw this firstly to Shona. Um, great question. Do you know, the response so far has been so wonderful. As a curator, pulling this exhibition together, um, you really hope that when you open the doors up, the audiences will come in, and they'll, they'll get it, they'll get the messages that we're trying to send. And really one of the key messages we were trying to express in this exhibition is that we were telling two stories, the, the perspective of those on the shore and of course of those on the ship. And really, uh, in particular to the Indigenous perspective, this has been largely missing from um, history for such a long time. and. I think it's one of the things I'm most proud about this exhibition is that we are really redressing that imbalance. So for the most part, everybody has been so grateful for this new, this new information and new story that they can learn from. And I, I think I'd add to that that, you know, a lot of the exhibition has been almost co-curated with those communities that we've been working with. And, uh, you know, they were really excited about the opportunity to tell this story from their perspective. People commented, no one's ever come to us and said, 
what's, what's your account of what happened in 1770? So we're really you know, pleased that we've been able to incorporate that into um, the exhibition. And I think it is one of the real, the strengths of the show. And that's kind of what audiences are kind of telling us. And that's great to hear. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, look, we have a question here from Susie G. Welcome, Susie. Now, Susie is saying that she teaches Year 4 History and they missed out on their trip to Melbourne this year. I'm really sorry to hear that. She's going to be encouraging them to visit with their families. So this is more of a comment. Look, Susie, thanks so much. Um, I have to admit that a lot of the content we have actually aimed towards school children who are studying this and there's sections that really speak directly to school children. So that's perfect. We're really delighted to hear that. Now, here we have a question from Meg. So, oh, okay, and it's for Lily, for me. So, Lily, you mentioned some art programs and projects with East Coast communities. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Are these artworks in the exhibitions? Okay, absolutely, Meg. So, uh, there's more than 100 artworks that were created by school children. First of all, we had a sort of pilot program that we ran in Ainsley here in Canberra um, at Ainsley School. And then we ran the project or the program in Cooktown State School with a range of students from year four to year six. Uh, and then we ran another program exactly the same as this. It's a two day art program uh, in La Perouse in Sydney. And they both had exactly the same format. The first day was printing, the second day was uh, watercolors um, and gouache painting. And both of them were also introduced by storytellers, local elders and community leaders. Now, all of the works that were created in this program, whether it was Cooktown or Canberra or Sydney, they've all come back to Australia. We personally, in fact, did transport them ourselves uh, from these different places and brought them back so they could be shown in time for the exhibition. And we've made a selection of them in three different sections in the show. We've even included a video. We actually gave a video camera and a small camera to some of the year nine students in Cooktown. And we said, just film us and record us doing this. And we've been able to make a video of this as well. And you can in fact find this on the website. Uh, we do have an amazing website that accompanies this exhibition, www.nma.gov.au. And you can find a blog that Shona and I wrote together. Shona was also very much involved in these art workshops uh, in which we show this video of us working in Cooktown with the kids. And we do talk about some of the work that was created. And they're just spellbinding. They're really amazing. One that really jumps out at me when I think about them um, was a boy in La Perouse, a young man who created a, a drawing or a painting really of the ship and it's peopled with all these men with machine guns and there's people standing on the shore with spears and ready to fight back and it's an incredibly moving image. Uh, so yep, they're on display in the exhibition, do come and see them and also look at our website. Now we have a question here from Marie. I feel absolutely privileged, oh, sorry, uh, this is a comment. I feel absolutely privileged to be able to view this especially on day one of our lockdown in Melbourne. Thank you so much, it's so interesting. Well, thank you, we're really delighted you can be here with us. This is David, oh, who tells us that he has watched every stream. So special welcome to our supporter, David. Thanks so much for being with us. Do you feel the exhibition reflects the interaction of Cook as a man of science, as well as an explorer and brilliant navigator, cartographer, with Australia's first peoples? Okay, that's a really great and very complex question. I'm gonna throw this one to Ian. Thanks, Sully. Look, I think you've, you've got to the heart of it there. Um, this is a story that's got all of those elements in it. And I think part of the challenge for Australia is trying to resolve how you kind of tell this story with all of those aspects in it. Uh, you know, the, the navigational achievements, the botanical work that Banks and Solander were doing, but also the impact of that voyage and its connection to a longer uh, history that unrolls of, you know, Indigenous uh, people being dispossessed of their land, enormous disruption to their culture. All of those elements are part of this one story. And what we've done in the show is try to find a way that we can tell all of those without kind of saying it's this or it's that. It's actually all of them. And really the challenge for Australians now is to work out how do we honour all of those things in marking this moment. And that's, that's what we've tried to do in the show. I just did want to comment on uh, some of those comments that are rolling in about the, the lockdown. Um, of course, the exhibition here was due to open in early April 
and we of course couldn't open it until June and so that's why we have got this fantastic website um, because we, we pivoted into trying to recreate the exhibition in an online way. And so really, if those people who can't come to the show, do go on and have a look at that website. Yeah, thanks Ian. Look, we're coming to the end of our program. We do have time for a few more questions. Uh, please be reassured that if we don't get to your questions, we are going to respond to them in the public comments below. So we're just gonna to move to answering a few more now. This one's from Maria. Hello, Maria. Did they write anything, uh, this is a great question, did they write anything about the water when they came in? Was the water clear? Could they see to the bottom of the bay? With less environmental impact, it must have been pristine. Look, who wants to answer this one? Well, I will tackle a little bit of it. For instance, in the journals, um, Cook and the crew, uh, particularly Cook, is recording so much detail about what he's seeing, about the measurements, how far away from the land, he's drawing pictures. There is a lot of information. He's also measuring uh, the depth of waters in the bay. I don't recall so much um, information about the, the clearness of the water, but there are certainly, particularly when they were coming um, in and through the Great Barrier Reef, they were hauling the lead. So they were throwing out this rope with a, a weight on the end of it and taking measurements to see how deep it was to make sure they weren't going to collide with any uh, coral shoals. And I believe that on the end of that um, lead was actually a, a sticky type su substance. So when they would bring it up, they could see what was actually on the bottom of the waters that they were passing over. For instance, it might have had some sand on it if they were in the sandy shoals. Maybe the next time they threw it, it would return with some of the corally outcrops or rocks. And so they knew what kind of, um, I guess, bed, seabed they were uh, moving across. And I, I think, um, you know, to go to the, the issue about environmental change, when you visit Botany Bay uh, and you go to what's called Cook's Landing Place uh, on the south side of the bay, you're really struck by how different that landscape is now um, compared to what it would have been in 1770. You know, you've got the, the airport, Kingsford Smith Airport, you've got the, the massive um, Botany uh, container terminal, and then you've also got the, um, the, the petroleum refinery. So it is a really different landscape uh, now to what it would have been in 1770. But, you know, the community at La Perouse it is still a place of great uh, significance to them with very strong attachments to all of that bay. Oh, thank you. Look, we have a question from Meg. Are you doing more virtual tours of the exhibition? Look, absolutely, Meg, yes. Uh, and if you email programs at nma.gov.au, we'll send you more information about them. We'll also be updating, I'm sure, our website and social media platforms with information about this. Okay, I have a question here from Jeremy. Now, on a project like this, how many people does it take to produce an exhibition? Shona. Well, that's a great question as well, actually. These kinds of exhibitions takes a whole raft of people. And we kind of like to describe exhibition building as almost like you, what you see, what audiences see is really the tip of the iceberg. Behind the scenes, there is so many people that are working to build an exhibition that is really engaging, that is safe, that looks beautiful. So we've got everybody from creative producers, designers, conservation team, painters, decorators, really there is a, a massive amount of people and we're just a small portion of the project team that goes towards producing this exhibition. Mm -hmm. I think that at a certain point everyone in the museum is working on the exhibition. And that's actually a really great feeling when you know that everyone's pulling together on the same project as you, working really hard to realise something as, as well as possible. And I, I'd also um, add to that of course all those members of the um, communities along the east coast of Australia, the Indigenous communities, who have, you know, worked so closely with us in making it, they're, they're equally a part of the team that has put this show together. Yeah, thanks. Look, we have a comment from Maria. So it's fantastic that their voices are being heard. Yeah, thanks, Maria. And we also have a final comment, and this is from Leanne. So welcome Leanne, he says, a great presentation, 
thank you. Clark and I had the privilege of seeing this incredible exhibition last week. Fantastic work with a smiley face. So thank you, Leanne, and thank you to Clark for visiting. Look, thanks so much, Shona and Ian. It's always a pleasure to talk with you about this exhibition. Thanks, Lily. Endeavour Voyage, the untold stories of Cook and the First Australians is now open to the public. We hope that many of you were able to come to the exhibition, see the show, and tell us what you think about this history by leaving us a comment or a drawing at the end in the area where we do invite visitors to respond. And I'd just like to say we look at each and every one of these and it, it is something quite important to us. And we do really want to make sure that your voice is part of this exhibition as well. Now, if of course you're unable to come to the exhibition, then do visit our website, www.mma.gov.au. We have created a huge website which mirrors the exhibition content. And we want those who aren't able to physically visit the exhibition to feel as though they're able to understand the content of the exhibition and experience it for themselves. This includes all the multimedia elements as well. Now I'm just going to give a quick plug for next week's program which is going to be on ethical sourcing and sustainable products in the museum shop which is going to be with Matilda and Martin. I'm sure that's going to be a fantastic program. Thanks so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you another time. Hi, I'm Matilda. Hi, I'm Martin. And we're part of the retail team at the museum shop. So here at the shop, we're really passionate about brands that are sustainable and ethical. When we talk about buying ethically and sustainably, it's really important to consider brands that actually actively support and sustain cultures. Now, as much as ever, it's also important to support Indigenous-owned and operated businesses. At the museum shop, we also really carefully consider how we source and sell Indigenous art products. So we do this by making sure we always work with certified art centres who are signatories to the Indigenous Art Code. When people think of plastic products, they often think of a harmful, wasteful material that's bad for the environment. But this isn't always the case. Dinosaur Designs is a really well-known brand, but few people actually know how their products are made. They use a low-impact resin that's derived from a byproduct of the petroleum industry. So this makes their products not only beautiful, but sustainable. So thanks for coming on a journey through the museum shop with us today. We hope you've seen that there are many different ways to shop ethically. But it doesn't have to be a challenge and it doesn't have to be a struggle. It can actually be really enjoyable to discover all the ways to shop ethically. 